Now I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, August 21, 2018. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Troop 292, visiting all the way from Abingdon. Please come forward. Um, the troop is working on their communication merit badge. Uh, we will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Please. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Thank you, Troop 292. First item on our agenda is to consider our agenda. Uh, Mrs. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Uh, next is sign-up cards. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn will be our speakers for tonight. And I ask Ms. Adequoya to draw 10 cards and Mr. Stork to read us the names. Our first speaker is Kathy Perry. Our second is Chris Kurtz. Third is Sharon Saroff. Fourth is Dr. Lori Taylor Mitchell. That's it. Very good. Um, I failed to read right after uh, the agenda that earlier this, ev this evening the board convened a closed session in accordance with the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of our closed session may be found on the county's, uh, county schools website at uh, www.bcps.org backslash board backslash minutes backslash. All right. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community The members of the board appreciate hearing from all of you. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone uh, to utilize existing uh, dispute resolution processes <coughs> when appropriate. Uh, I ask you again to, re, uh, to observe the three-minute clock, we'll, which will let you know when your time is up. Our first speakers are our advisory and stakeholder group. Um, and our first speaker from that group is TABCO's representative, Abby Baton. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board. Tomorrow, our schoolhouses will be filled with teachers readying their classrooms and workspaces for the beginning of another school year. Many of them have already sacrificed part of their summer vacation to work in their schools preparing for students. That doesn't even include those who spent a lot of the summer writing curriculum and doing the myriad of, of jobs that have to be done during the summertime. Each school year brings changes, and this one is no exception. We have asked for a better way to deal with discipline and the proposed arrangement of the school zones, including a zone specific to address safety and discipline issues, seems very appropriate. As long as the decisions are collaborative in nature and followed countywide, <clears throat> we hope this may bring about some of the changes we've been advocating for. 
As far as changing the schools into three zones, we feel with the beltway traffic in our area, having geographic zones makes much more sense. We are still working within feeder patterns. Within the, with the addi addition of an elementary director in each zone, we expect a better use of time as well as a more reasonable distribution between executive directors. We look forward to working within the new arrangement and hope that together we can make this transition as smooth as possible. I want to thank the board for allocating assistant principals to our smaller elementary schools. We have been advocating for that all year. This, the, these schools have struggled with the lack of a second administrator and we advocated for this quite a bit. This is one good step toward providing our students with the resources they need for success. This is my 28th year in Baltimore County. I did teach in Anne Arundel before. My 28th first day of school. Every first day brings with it that same excitement and possibility. I look forward to what we will do together this school year. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education is Julie miller Bretz. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, Ms. White, and the BCPS community. During the last Board of Education meeting at which I presented, I mentioned that issues of identification and programming are at the crux of the GT experience. It is this experience that the GTCAC will be highlighting this year as we look critically through the lens of a GT child's classroom experience. What these students are offered, how it is delivered, how they are grouped, and what opportunities the system provides for enrichment and acceleration. Curriculum is a critically important facet of this GT student's educational experience, and it's why I was so pleased to be able to attend the Curriculum Writing Visitors Day at Newtown High School in July. It is so evident during these workshops that teachers are fully invested in the effort and work it takes to write really excellent curriculum. The amount of thought and collaboration apparent during my visit was really exciting to see, and it's something I wish everyone could see. The dedication to a great product is really commendable. It's also so exciting to see that there are now three new members of the Office of Advanced Academics who will now be available to help with this curriculum writing experience. Yay. Uh, for those community members who would like to know more about GT, curriculum, we invite you to our first meeting of the 2018-19 school year, where we will be hosting Natalie Christ, supervisor in the math office, and Megan Shea, the interim executive director of academics. We are looking forward to hearing them share new resources and focal areas that will impact GT students across the content areas, and we would love for anyone with an interest to join us. Our meeting will be on Wednesday, September 5th at 7 o'clock right here in Greenwood in room 114. We know that a good curriculum engages and deepens the understandings of the learner while also allowing the teacher to determine the best avenues to reach the student. However, that brings to mind questions about how the general education curriculum differs from the GT curriculum and how BCPS addresses such things as what are the specific indicators of a high quality curriculum as articulated by general education curriculum experts and how is that distinct or how does it overlap with high quality curriculum as articulated by gifted education curriculum experts? How is BCPS bridging these needs and how is that being communicated to parents? How does the gifted education curriculum model employed by BCPS address the needs of highly able learners? How is this communicated to parents and how do parents know it's working? And in what areas might gifted curriculum need improvement? What does the data show? We look forward to learning about and exploring these issues and others during this school year. Our meetings are always open to the public, so if you're curious, please join us at either our meeting on September 5th or any of our other meetings which occur on the first Wednesday of every month at 7 o'clock. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> our next speaker is the representative from Case, Tom DeHart. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, and members of the board. Tonight you will be asked to approve a strategic, limited reorganization of BCPS executive leadership. The Council of Administrative and Supervisory Employees is in full support of this reorganization, and there are several reasons for this. First, this reorganization supports the vision of the superintendent, literacy, and school culture. 
the creation of a division of school climate and safety with dedicated and focused chief level leadership speaks directly to the degree of importance and leverage of this division. It addresses concerns regarding student safety voiced by all stakeholders as it aligns resources for the physical and social emotional needs of our students, creating a more viable conduit to the schoolhouse. It also ensures the effective use of additional staffing that was given to BCBS by the late County Executive Kamenetz. Secondly, at the last board meeting, I spoke to you about my enthusiasm for the commitment from the system to ongoing collaboration between and amongst zone leadership. This helps to create much needed consistency and iterator reliability around principal growth and evaluation. I said then that the most important thing an executive director does is increase the skills of the building principal. This reorganization allows executive directors to supervise a far more manageable number of principals, thereby increasing their ability to coach, supervise, and grow principal effectiveness. The move from four zones to three begins to address the concerns Case has had regarding consistency as well. Lastly, this reorganization speaks to both of Superintendent White's, Superintendent White's foci based on her vision. A good leader has a vision, shares it, lives it, and supports it in any number of ways, but most notably by organizing resources and staff to support the vision and Ms. White is an excellent instructional leader. Some may suggest that reorganization should wait until a new superintendent is named. Case feels, however, that we've waited long enough. And frankly, we support Ms. White as the next superintendent. We applaud the fact that Ms. White is putting her fingerprints on the system and encourage her to continue. Because as Louise Heath Lieber says, there's always room for improvement. It's the biggest room in the house. Thank you very much, and congratulations to the folks who are behind me who are being appointed tonight. Thank you. Uh, the board is always appreciative when our local elected officials uh, are able to join us, and I want to recognize Councilman David Marks, who is here with his friends from Gunpowder Elementary School. Councilman, thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. Next on our agenda is public comment, and our first speaker is Kathy Perry. Hello. Good evening. I will be probably very brief. I'm with Gunpowder Elementary School, and I'm a grandparent there. My grandchildren go there, and we are very concerned about the parking there that lacks the parking. There's only a handful of parking spaces, but there's room to improve that and move up the road a little bit because Gunpowder Elementary School is a very active school. They have many, many activities after school and in the evening for the children, the parents, and siblings. And when you go to, up there to park, it's a little crazy. Um, on Grandparents' Days, especially on American Education Week, <laughs> we walk a long way. We're old. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, there is room there, and we're just hoping you'll have room in your budget and in your hearts to help us keep our school healthy and our children healthy and safe. Because with all the parking on the street, it can be very difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Chris Kurtz. Good evening. First, I would like to thank the board for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Chris Kurtz, and I have been an active volunteer at Gunpowder Elementary for the last 13 years and still have several more to go. Um, I am currently the PTA president. I, along with others from both the school community and the surrounding neighborhood, are here to ask that Gunpowder get additional parking as soon as possible. Our parking lot now only has 41 line spots, seven of which are reserved. We currently have 63 staff members. This will increase because our enrollment is increasing every day. Um, this also doesn't include open door employees or tiny tots employees. So that being said, we're already over the limit between people that work there and the parking. Um, add to that volunteers and visitors and it becomes a sticky situation on any given day. 
Um, as anyone who is familiar with our school and neighborhood knows that the surrounding streets become a virtual parking lot every school day during arrival and dismissal. The way our current parking lot is configured, there is no real way to implement a kiss and go. We are a well-knit community and have many wonderful events at Gunpowder. Hot dog night, we get over 600 people. We have cross country, which includes seven other schools, so you're looking at over 700 people at that point. Um, field trips, American Education Week, the list goes on. With the additional houses being built now on Baker Lane um, and the pending selling of the Klossmeyer Farm, this will only get worse. Something needs to be done, and it needs to be done sooner than later. And if you think I'm exaggerating, come to Hot Dog Night, September 28th. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening, members of the board, Chairman Gillis, Dr. White. The first day of school is two weeks away, and I have a question for the county concerning special ed, are we ready? And after spending the good portion of my July vacation in IEP meetings and gaining several new clients, I would have to say no. We still do not have equal special ed programs in all parts of the county, regional programs that are necessary in some parts of the county don't exist. Students are then told that the only place they can be put is in the general education environment. If it's appropriate, that's fine. There are students, though, who it's not appropriate to be in a general education environment. It's more appropriate for them to be in a small classroom with a one-on-one, -on -one, making sure that they are getting their services, making sure that they're able to communicate, and they are not getting those services. I did an intake today with a parent whose child has difficulty communicating and doesn't have a communication device to help her communicate. And she only has one hour a week of speech and language to teach her. I did an intake earlier this summer with a parent who told me that her child's supposed to have a one-on-one -on -one because she has a seizure disorder and she hasn't had a one-on-one -on -one all of last year, and there was at least one time when there was a seizure disorder, when the seizure took place, and there was nobody there in the classroom with her. That's why I'm saying we are not ready. Following the IEP is a safety issue. I know we are very focused right now on safety, and if we're not following those IEPs, we're not focused enough on safety. I applaud what you're trying to do, Dr. White. I really do. However, um, I don't agree with having three community superintendents. The amount we had last year didn't do the job. I don't see where less is more. I hope that we can get ready within the next two weeks. Our next speaker is Laurie Taylor Mitchell. Good evening. I'm Lori, Dr. Laurie Taylor Mitchell, and tonight I'm discussing the issue of food access. It is a great first step that BCPS is funding the costs of reduced price meals for all students, which will help about 7,000 low-income students. But much more can be done if BCPS would elect the Community Eligibility Provision, or CEP, in the 51 schools eligible through grouping in our system. Nearly 27,000 students in these schools would benefit from breakfast and lunch offered to them at no charge, with the majority of costs paid for by the federal government. The reasons for given for not electing CEP remain puzzling. 
The premise that changing from the definition of poverty provided through the free and reduced price meal system will negatively affect benefits for students in poverty or that CEP will affect overall Title I funding are not accurate. Over 8 million students in over 17,000 schools nationwide benefit from CEP, including the Houston system where 191 schools have elected CEP and all of Baltimore City. How many children now paying for meals would be covered if all 51 schools elected CEP? Over 2,400 students paying full price would benefit at those high poverty schools where many whose family incomes are too high for farms still struggle economically. At the four schools implementing CEP, 1,125 formerly paying students now benefit at those high poverty schools. CEP is well worth the cost and effort because of the tremendous suffering and negative effects on children caused by hunger and food insecurity. As the founder of a program that works with our students experiencing poverty, I regularly see the extent of hunger in our schools, and I implore you not to wait two more years to study CEP. Here are some examples from BCPS staff, parents, students, or that I have heard myself. School staff members buying food with their own money for hungry students. Students visiting the school nurse with symptoms of hunger. Discipline problems where hunger was an underlying issue. Cafeteria workers buying food for children with no lunch money. Children not eating in the cafeteria at lunchtime. Students bringing an empty lunchbox pretending they have food. And finally, I recently listened to a teacher from a high poverty school crying as she described the hungry children in her school and the distress of her young daughter who worried about her friend and fellow student who did not have food. You've all received information tonight on CEP. There is still time before the deadline of September 4th to elect additional schools for CEP. With wages stagnant or small increases wiped out by inflation, the economic situation is often worse now for our struggling students and their families. There are too many hungry children in our schools, and every moment lost to hunger is a moment stolen from education. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item F, personnel matters. I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice evening. Chairman Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, deceased, recognition of service. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits F1 through F3? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Are all our job openings posted prior to uh, those positions being filled? Yes. And is that a um, in, pol in board policy? Is that a requirement of board policy? I have no idea. That's okay. The jobs are posted online. Okay. And in enough time for, all, for interested candidates to apply yes. for consideration. Um, I noticed uh, and have been noticing that the, um, there have been a lot of promotions from stat teacher to AP. And so I, I began to track that. And I just wanted to see what your comment was um, because there are about, uh, I'm going to say about 150 stat teachers, is that correct? I don't know right offhand how many stat Something teachers in that neighborhood. About 40% of our staff population. Um, no. I'm sorry, 0.8% of our staff population. But they're receiving about 40% of the promotions to AP. So I'm wondering if there's... Are there special qualifications for STAT? Or, and do you have any comments on, I mean, it seems like this is the fast track to that position. I can um, take a stab at that one. In terms of what our STAT teachers do, our STAT teachers spend an incredible amount of time as professional developers specifically uh, addressing instruction. And so one of the, the unique qualifications for any leader, particularly an instructional leader, is to know the co components of high quality instruction. And so I do think that um, not only our stat teachers, but many times our resource teachers, we have um, master teachers, we have department chairmen, who spend a great deal of time learning how to give feedback about high quality instruction, which is a skill in itself. 
which makes them many times uniquely qualified. Anything you want to add further? Ms. No. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Next on our agenda is administrative appointments, and I uh, call on Mrs. White to present those appointments. Thank you, Chairman Gillis, members of the board. I'm bringing forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal Dundalk Middle School, Assistant Principal Hollibird Middle School, Assistant Principal Towson High School, Assistant Principal Padonia International Elementary School, Board Certified Behavior Analyst, those are three positions, and Specialist in the Office of Compliance and Office of Title I. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit G1? So moved. Is there a second? second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Mrs. White. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. <laughs> My pleasure to introduce the following individuals. When you hear your name, please stand along with your friends and family so that we can recognize you. First, we have Natalie Adams, who will be the new principal of Dundalk Middle School. So, Natalie, who's all here with you? Who's all here with you? Congratulations. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize Karen Ballard, who will be the new assistant principal at Hollabird Middle School. <laughs> and do you have friends or family here with you this evening? I'd also like to recognize Lucrecia Bacon, who will be a new board certified behavior analyst. Do you have anyone here with you this evening? Well, we're your family now. Congratulations. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Kimberly Culbertson, who will be the new assistant principal at Towson High School. friends or family here with you tonight? I brought my wonderful friends and mentors from Delaney and my wonderful supportive female support group. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Lauren Dorsey, who will be the assistant principal at Padonia International Elementary School. <laughs> hey, Lauren, do you have anyone with you tonight? Congratulations. I'd also like to introduce Brenda Strumke, who will be the board certified behavior analyst in the Office of Special Education. Anyone with you this evening? I brought my husband, Congratulations. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce Amanda, Amanda Tinknell, who will be a board certified behavior analyst in the Office of Special Education as well. Amanda, do you have anyone here with you tonight? <laughs> Again, we're your family now. <laughs> and I'd also like to introduce Evelyn Tolliver, who will be the specialist in the Office of Compliance, Office of Title I. <laughs> Evelyn, do you have anyone here with you tonight? <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> our point, Ms. Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Congratulations to all of you. Next on our agenda is item H, uh, consideration of proposed organizational changes for the 2018-2019 school year. Mrs. White, you're on again. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will ask Dr. Mayo and Mr. Saris to to the table. And congratulations again to all of our new appointments. Wow. <laughs> 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 
So good evening again, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, members of the board. I'm excited to bring to you this evening a proposal for the reorganization of the executive team beginning in the 2018-19 school year for your consideration and approval. To explain my thinking and rationale, I will outline the what, why, and how of the proposal. First, the what. What is the current structure? In our current structure, there are four community zones, each comprised of one community superintendent, two executive directors, and one director of school performance. In the proposed structure, there would be three community zones, each comprised of one community superintendent and three executive directors. One community superintendent position would be converted into the chief of school climate and safety position to emphasize and streamline efforts related to student safety in BCPS. The natural questions that may emerge related to this shift may be, why is this change important? Why will it work better than the current model? And why now? I'm proposing this bold new model for the executive team as a measure to directly respond to the requests shared with me by our community over the past year. If you will recall, last year I held 10 listening and learning tours. We also partnered with the area advisory councils to hold five student behavior and discipline hearings. I was also present when the board held its own discipline hearing last year. Additionally, I've met with principals, teachers, parents, business partners, our bargaining units throughout the past year in a variety of forums from advisory meetings to leadership development sessions and certainly there were common themes in the feedback that I received. Those themes are number one, student safety. Number two, community consistency. Number three, academic coaching and accountability. And number four, academic services. <clears throat> the first theme of, of student safety is the primary reason for this change. Over the past year, the community shared with me that yes, although they feel confident that our schools are safe and they trust BCPS with their children, they have asked us to put a greater emphasis on not only the physical safety of students, but also the social and emotional well-being of students as well. Parents have asked for greater emphasis on bullying, anxiety, suicide prevention, as well as student behavior and discipline. As you know, I created the Office of School Climate last year to address many of these issues. However, school communities want to see a direct connection and specific actions that will not only address discipline, but also victim support. In this proposed structure, the Chief of School Climate and Safety will be accountable for the Office of School Safety led by the Executive Director of Safety and the Office of Climate led by a newly developed Executive Director of Social and Emotional Support to that end. Data will be collected related to consequences and support and will be analyzed to determine patterns and trends that will help direct our paths forward that will also serve as a catalyst for conversations with my student behavior and discipline council. Teachers and principals will benefit under, under this new proposed structure as professional development will be streamlined and resource personnel will be mobilized based on that data to provide direct support to teachers and schools in a more efficient manner. The second theme that emerged was that of community consistency. Over the past year, communities have asked for a singular point of contact for community-related issues. For instance, when there was a horrific event in the Perry Hall area related to the tragic death of Officer Capri Caprio, all community superintendents were involved in those crucial communication efforts. In those critical moments, it is important to have clear communication with designated points of contact. The proposed East central and west zone assignments will allow schools to be grouped by theater patterns and will create greater consistency among the zones, which was also a recommendation provided by the Magnet Task Force. 
This proposal also moves each zone from two executive directors to three per zone. Again, getting closer to, those, to the school's support. Two elementary executive directors and one secondary executive director. This shift brings me to the third theme that emerged not just in the community meetings, but in our data as well. We know that our schools, particularly those that have shifted their methods of teaching, are growing students academically. After careful review, however, I believe we can and we should accelerate the rate of student performance, particularly in the areas of reading and mathematics. Our focus on literacy across the disciplines, including mathematics, is one way to get there. However, shifting our structure is another way to get there as well and another way to do so. By shifting the zone accountability structure from two executive directors to three, the elementary executive directors, for instance, will go from approximately 30 schools to supervise to 18. This will provide our principals and teachers with greater face time with our executive directors for consistent instructional coaching as well as greater academic accountability. There is also another benefit to this proposal that goes beyond the executive director level. By shifting the Office of Climate to the Chief of School Climate and Safety, we will be able to move the Office of Advanced Academics and ESOL office under the Department of Academic Services, which includes special education, Title I, college and career readiness. These services can be enhanced by connecting these offices to provide a greater focus on the twice exceptional learner, on, on um, giftedness and poverty, as well as a focus on our, the service to our highly abled learners, as well as a service to our English language learners as well. So as you can see, the reasons behind the why of this proposal are many. The why now aspect is simply because we do not have time to wait another year. In a perfect world, I would wait so that until a new board comes on board, I would wait to be considered permanent superintendent. However, our community has spoken. They continue to speak to us, to ask us to focus immediately on safety and academics. So this proposal, I believe, does just that. The how of the proposal is also worth examining. We are able to make this shift by reallocating existing positions to streamline our efforts for greater efficiency. It is FTE neutral and does not require any additional funding, which is also a fiscally responsible approach toward greater efficiency. Again, I want to thank the community for coming out, for your honesty, and for your insight. And I'd like to thank the Board of Education in advance for your consideration. With that, I have Dr. Mayo and Mr. Saris, and, and, all of, and I am here as well, to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Let's, uh, let's start with a motion. Do I have a motion to approve the organizational changes for 2018-19 as presented in Exhibit H1? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Now we can have discussion. Mrs. Causey. If you could uh, please uh, reiterate the comments about moving the Office of Advanced Academics and ESOL. Uh, th that was not in any of the information that we had previously True, received. True, because that, for those offices, you're talking about the coordinator. But I think in the spirit of transparency, I wanted the public to know that those services to children are, um, are right now in the academics department, and which is great there. But in terms of service, we can provide greater service, particularly when we're looking at giftedness and poverty, when we're talking about the twice exceptional learner. Those are areas that our community and our advisory councils have been asking us to focus on by connecting them with the offices that exist in academic services, such as the Office of Special Education, the Office of Title I, it gives, a, again, a greater fluency and accountability and service to students and provides a, a greater light. I remember um, being a part of GTCAC's meeting last year when we talked about um, shining a brighter light on the gifted learner. We've also talked about shining a brighter light on our twice exceptional learners, and this will give us, afford us the opportunity to do so. 
Could you just expand on that, specifically where they are now and how moving them is going to be more effective? Again, so again, when we're talking about professional development to our teachers, professional development, not just based on the academics, but also on those social emotional learning supports, the unique characteristics of those uh, specific learners that we can, again, look at the entire continuum of service for special education, for instance. When we think of special education, many times we marginalize it to just one area, but we're looking at the entire continuum of special education services. And again, that's not going to be a part of your packet because according to policy, you would typically look at executive director and above. However, I thought it would be important for the public and for the board for you to know the full spectrum um, of the changes that would occur that would be beneficial to the organization. Other questions or comments? Mrs. Miller. Um, I'm going to give you a word. Sure. Um, so Microphone. Thank you. We have the Office of School Climate, which is under curriculum and instruction, and we have the Department of School Safety. So can you describe the differences between those safety related departments and what the new duties will be for the chief and the new department. That's great. Well, right now, currently, as you stated, the Office of Safety lives on the business side of the organization, and the Office of School Climate lives on the instructional side of the organization. What we've learned over the course of the year is that we need to have those collaborative conversations so that we're not just having them in isolation. The Chief of School Climate and Safety will then have both of those offices under the same umbrella so that we're not having isolated conversations. We're looking at not only the physical support and safety of the student that currently exists with the Office of School Safety when it comes to the Raptor system and buzzing um, systems and the physical facility itself, and connecting those conversations to the social and emotional well-being of, of students. So that support that's provided by our psychologists, our counselors, our, our PPWs. And so it's important for those individuals to be on the same page and to be collaborative. So just to reiterate, those two offices are going to then move under yes. the new department. Yes. Okay. And, um, and all of the, of the special ed centers are all listed in one zone. Can you explain how that's going to work? And because uh, each, uh, or each new, not zone anymore, but each new area um, has the same number of support staff then, how is that going to play out with the special needs of those? Um and that, that part of it has not changed. The special um, education centers and schools have, are, have, are currently in the same zone, and that allows us to provide um, support. And particularly when those principals are able to get together, they are able to get together within that same zone and to provide that kind of unique support that they need um, because of the uniqueness of those buildings and, and the, their school population. So are there plans then to have more support staff or, or just something additional for that area? We have, as well, have that's, but that was the budget need. that you approved, uh, where we have, so if you'll recall, the theme of the budget was people for our people. And so we uh, asked for more resources, more staffing, more special educators, and we were very fortunate, and thanks to this board um, and your advocacy, we were able to realize uh, more resources. So more of those resources will be um, not just in our um, special education centers, but have been uh, advocated for it so that we can reduce the student to teacher ratio in our inclusive settings as well. Okay, but you're saying there'll be more specified for that area that contains the special It would be centers. the same staffing that they have right now based on the, what was approved through the, the budget. I'm not sure you understand what I'm saying. All of the special ed centers are in one area, so that one area is going to have more needs. Will, is there? They will continue with the service the that they have right now in their structure. Again, they do have specified needs, and we're able to meet those needs of the, the uniqueness of their buildings. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, I think that's it for me. Any other questions uh, about uh, the proposed organizational changes? Mrs. Causey. Thank you. So uh, 
for the board, this has first come up to us as a microphone. Thank you. As a board, this, this organization has first come to us in the board docs that we received Wednesday night. And um, after reviewing it and reviewing our current org charts and talking to um, some people, I sent in questions. Um, is this all of the information that we're going to receive? Yes, do you have additional questions? I believe I answered most of those questions in my opening, but I'm open to answering more of your questions. Okay, well, there's a difference between receiving information in writing with the org charts. Um, you're talking now about moving other um, offices as well and just hearing it verbally for the first time tonight. So to go back to Director of Special Education and Coordinator of Advanced Academics, um, right now they're in the Division of Curriculum and Instruction that reports ultimately to uh, Dr. McComas. So they would now be reporting to the new Chief of School Climate and Safety? No. No. So where, who, to whom will they report? Where they report, where they're reporting right now, Dr. McComas. You said the Office of Special Education. Yes. They're not moving. Okay, and then uh, Coordinator Advanced Academics. Same to Dr. McComas. They're staying. Okay, mm -hmm. so so you just mentioned Advanced Academics and Esau. Coordinator right, Doobie. and I know that that's, again, this is operational, and it's a level of detail that normally the board doesn't uh, receive because it is an operational piece. But I do think it's important for the public to understand how we've increased our focus. And with this proposal, we're increasing our focus on not only special education, but our gifted learners as well as our ESOL population. And to do so, I wanted to be able to bring that forward. So those specific offices would then move to academic services under Dr. Wisted, whom also reports to Dr. McComas under CNI. So that is a CNI just shift in offices, but it doesn't require um, board approval necessarily, but it does warrant um, a public, co public um, consideration and disclosure, yes. Okay, and, and so that is, a, that is an, uh, an option because you're moving the director office of school climate to the new chief um, of school climate and safety. Yes. So that whole organization is moving over. Yes. <clears throat> okay. And then um, you had mentioned that it's FTE neutral. Um, we had heard that with the reorganization that came about with the four community superintendents. But then when budget time came around, we found out it was actually a $600,000 annual increase in salaries. So the question is, is there any increase in salaries that goes along with this um, reorganization? Mr. Saris, would you like to yeah, shed some? Uh, the, uh, the net, uh, well, the, uh, the gross increase in salaries would be 58,000. The net increase would be a savings of 94,000 because uh, although two positions will be reclassified, one position will be maintained as vacant. And which position is that? That is a director position. And where is it right now? It's the director of school performance, which is currently under the zone chiefs. And one of the reasons why that position is vacant and remains vacant, and again, um, currently would be a cost savings, was because um, I think it was mentioned earlier that early on I converted uh, two of those director, two of the director positions, two assistant principals, because we had to take care of schools first. And we had to make sure that the schools had the administrative support that they needed. Many of our small schools um, did not have assistant principals, and they've shared with us that they needed that additional support. So we have given those small schools assistant principal positions, halftime positions, so that they would have that b benefit of administrative support. And I suspect that we're going to go through the year, but there may be an additional request, and we need to be positioned to respond to that school school request um, should it come up as we're going through the year. So let me just uh, make a minor correction. So we, we converted in total 
three positions to assistant principals. Only one of them was one of these directors. One will remain vacant and the other two will be reclassified to executive directors. And other questions? What, in what division will those executive director positions be? In the new division of school safety and climate. So there's one, one in school safety and climate and oh, there's the, the other one right. is for the um, community, superintendent community superintendent's right. executive director. Okay, so they're they're being reclassified. They're not new positions being created. That's right. Correct. Correct. Okay. And then, um, one of the um, major questions that I have is, how does how do we plan to make this transition in such a short time frame? Um, and also, where will each of the three area community superintendents and their executive directors be located? When we did the transition to community superintendents just two years ago, I guess just two years ago, um, some of those executive directors or directors of performances were inside schools. Mm -hmm. So what is the, um, the plan, would plan there? remain the same. And so again, you're asking about where they're going to physically sit. That's, that's the question? Yes. And okay. So, and that's, again, we wanted theirs. to make sure that we're, that our executive directors are close to schools and in schools. And so that that structure will not change. And uh, where our community superintendents are currently um, on the Greenwood campus would also remain the same. Okay. And then, you know, one of the concerns that I have is with transition, there's always a uh, time frame for all the information to get out for people to recall what's new, what's different, especially in the midst of um, new staff that we're bringing in to this um, current structure. Um, we had last year at Lock Raven High School a situation with a student that had a weapon and they went into lockdown and Baltimore County Police Department was called and it honestly went about as perfect as it could have gone. And it would um, be terrible in my mind if we are rushing through an organizational change literally the day before teachers show up to buildings and have these potential breakdowns when there has not been a time for transition. I know as a board member, I just received this information five days ago and it's, um, it's a lot to digest and while I, I certainly agree and we can all agree that safety is the priority for all of our students and in keeping our staff safe at our schools as well and in handling all of the different situations that relate to safety, whether it's the mental health of our own students, whether it's uh, outsiders coming in, and all of those situations are very important. I just feel like this has um, been very rushed in terms of information given to the board, not getting um, time to converse with you and, and to you know, get those questions answered in a, in a more organized fashion. So. And to that, Ms. Causey, I, I would say that I don't believe that it has been rushed at all. Our um, parents and communities and stakeholders have been talking to us for quite some time. Our teachers have been talking to us for quite some time. They've come here to many of our board members, uh, to our board meetings, and they have said to us that we need to emphasize safety. We need to do something, and we need to do something now. We need to do something in the immediate. I haven't heard yet that we need to, to wait. I do not believe that it's rust. Our, our principals are aware of the proposal. I've shared the proposal with our principals, so this is not a surprise to them. In terms of operationalizing it, you're talking about my executive team. And so it's a matter of, um, if once the board uh, approves, it's just a matter of communication with my executive team. And again, the principals are aware of whom their new supervisor, um, who which zone they would be in, not there who new, new supervisor would be, but they would know that as of tomorrow morning should the board approve. And so I don't think that it would be a hard transition. I, I do think that there would be a tremendous benefit to teachers and principals and community members, and it would be a response to our community that we uh, collectively are taking action, the action that they've been asking us to take for over a year now. And so this is a direct response to that. Mr. Stewart. So I <clears throat> just wanted to add that I think you 
thought that you misspoke in that you said that uh, folks have come to board members about this, but they have, in fact, come to board members about this. And I've been, since the change happened, uh, I, I get a question about it at least once every couple months uh, from folks and then emails as well, um, talking about how confusing the structure is and how they wish that the lines of responsibility were more clearly delineated and that they could better coordinate with their own school system. I think it's been a long time coming and I'm fully supportive uh, of the effort here and I think it's been documented. I think we have had uh, a fair amount of information and discussion about the issue. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Verge. Uh, Verlita, thanks for your comments tonight. Um, I just want to ask you, um, and I know that a lot of the focus has been on, or at least the focus among some of the discussion tonight has been on the upper levels of the reorganization. And I wanted to just talk, if I could, and not to denigrate, but the meat and potatoes here. Yeah. Um, when we were doing our operating budget deliberations, among those things that were discussed were like the focus on special education and on ESAW. And in special education, we were looking at like like 40 some new positions. Uh, and with ESAW, we were looking at like another 18 or so. Um, it was a total of like three to four million dollars in, in new spending, um, specifically geared to areas where a lot of comment had been received from our parents and our families, our staff, that we needed additional attention. And then there was the, f the other focus that, you know, I took away from this was the school climate focus. Um, between the student, between the school counselors and like the social workers, I mean, that's like two dozen new positions, as I recall. Yes. And then there was the behavior intervention, as we had one here tonight, uh, and then the psychologists, and also reaching out for bus attendance because of the need for bus attendance, and even health support, because you know we need to, we need to have that, and our student population brings with it the things in our in our own community, and we need to be able to address that from a health perspective. So we now have this new spending that. Our board supported and county government uh, has been strongly supporting based on your knowledge, your training, and your experience in various capacities in the system, plus having had a, a full year to have been the interim superintendent. This organization at these levels, which, as Brother Stewart said, makes a lot of sense geographically. Uh, when you go to like a, um, uh, a um, uh, citizen advisory uh, meeting and you might have a parent from one school, it's an elementary school, and you have a parent from a high school, and you find out that um, the uh, community superintendent might have had been sharing some of these different schools with different executive directors, it seems it'll be much more direct to go to one place for one-stop shopping. But in terms of the meat and potatoes, it seems like we have a lot of new resources to enhance school climate and if this brings the folks at this level closest to the students in more of an alignment with the folks that are up here I I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see what the disadvantage to that is is that part of your thinking Absolutely. I, again, it's about focus. I, I spoke to the administrators and the system leaders yesterday, and that was our theme about staying focused and how we uh, emphasize support. And so for all the new positions that you've named, you think about our Department of Academic Services right now. Currently, in that um, office, you have the Office of Title I. You have College and Career Readiness. You have School Counseling. You have the PPWs, the psychologist. Uh, you have the Health Services. You have um, all of those various offices, which ones am I missing? Uh, it's so many offices there. School climate, do we have uh, counseling, lots of other services that are there. This, again, helps us to do what we've advocated for yesterday, and that is to focus. So then when we're talking about, when, we, when we're talking about the again, not only the physical safety of students, but the social emotional safety and well-being of students. By shifting that and under the same umbrella, we're able to have that singular focus of safety and student behavior discipline support under that same umbrella. Similarly, 
We've streamlined efforts in academic services so that we are properly serving kids without being stretched. So on a practical sense, when a principal calls for that type of support um, to say, well, how do I meet the needs of my gifted learner? How do I meet the needs of um, my several ESOL uh, students? We want to make sure that not only do we have the resource teachers who are deployed to, to service uh, the students and to work with the teachers, but that we are streamlining that support and professional development and we have a singular focus in that department as well. So I do see a benefit on both sides uh, and not just, and that's the reason why I brought up those offices, because I do see a benefit that will permeate throughout the system and hopefully the teachers will feel that direct support in the classroom. Other questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Hayden. Uh, a couple of things. Mr. Cyrus, you talked about the savings we're, we're saving because we have a position that's not filled and we're not going to fill it again. So we're saving money that we didn't spend by not spending it again. How is that saving money? Um, I think that's what you said as I listened. We're saving money by leaving a position vacant. Okay, but it's not saving it over what we're spending today. Yeah. We're not spending it today. By we are spending it vacant, you said. We're going to leave it vacant. So well, we're we haven't we, we were spending it until that position became vacant, yes. So we've been spending it up until recently, and we will not be spending it going forward. It's, in the, it's a budgeted amount which won't be spent. I understand that piece of it, but again, I'm relating back to savings. If we haven't been spending it, and when did we stop spending it? We but stopped spending it when the person in that position uh, received a promotion. So if this reorg, for instance, at the last meeting, and so at, the, at this uh, reorg, if it's not approved, for instance, and we were to stick with the organizational chart that we have currently, we would have to fill those positions um, so that we continue service. So then we would have to then maintain that level of spending by shifting uh, those positions that are now currently vacant because of a promotion. We have an opportunity here. And then we have an opportunity for cost savings as well. Um. Go ahead, Mr. Hayden. The other thing that comes to mind is how much time the board's had on this. How long did the staff work on this before they came up with this suggestion that they've given to the board? Yeah, so again, this, this um, proposal, if you will, has been in development. And in a, in a perfect world, and I believe I said this in my opening, I would have proposed this back in uh, May or May, June or even during the budget session, but we know that things happen. And so this board and the public, you're quite aware that, that things happen. I would love to be able to sit here and do this again as your permanent superintendent. But not knowing what was going to happen, I did hold on the proposal. Um, but recently, when we continued to hear from our parents, when we had parents just at the last board meeting suggest to us that we have to do something and we have to do something now, it is not about interim status. It is not about title and position. It is about what the responsible thing to do is and how immediately we want to work. Many of uh, our board members have talked about the urgency of focusing our organization on student safety and support, and the urgency of working directly with our schools. And I believe that that sense of urgency led us to, just from the last board meeting, to be able to put, put forth this proposal that can be implemented um, with, a, I believe, a smooth transition. Again, the principals are aware of the proposal. That has not um, been rushed. Our uh, advisory councils have been asking for greater consistency. They want one point of contact when they are working with their advisory councils and with their uh, community superintendents. Our, many of our advisory councils have said 
did so during our Joint Advisory Council meetings and many of your dinner sessions with them. And so when I've spoken to the advisory councils um, and I've spoken to the bargaining units and I've also talked to teachers and principals and community members, they shared with me the urgency of now. So I know that the timing is not ideal, but I do think it can be implemented well. It is a thoughtful plan. It is one that is fiscally responsible and it is one that we can where we can move the system forward not only for safety but also for academics with greater emphasis and support and accountability when it comes to student performance it doesn't you still haven't gotten to my point my point is I think perhaps I might have been the first one in some budget thing a while back to say that safety was number one we all know that and we've known it for some time but what have we done to put this structure together to say this is where we should go and this is how we should go and it seems like everybody except the board has been involved in this process from what you just said and I think that is absolutely wrong the board has got to be more involved and have a bigger understanding of this because it is ultimately not your responsibility but our responsibility how these things work and I am sorely disappointed that we have a situation not unlike some others we've had in the past where we get last minute information you gotta vote on this tonight and and I think that's a big mistake I think we should take the time the board should take the time to look at this and understand it through the next couple of weeks and then come back and talk it over Ms. Adekoya and then Mrs. Hen okay so I wanted to say, if not now, then when? For what I understand, the proposed reorganization is to counteract the feedback of data received from administrators, teachers, students regarding safety and academics. There's a continuous issue of climate, culture, safety, and academics in our system, so why not allow for the implementation of a reorganization that will help the, stu uh, that will help the students? Mrs. Han. Thank you. Um, Mrs. White, in your remarks, which I appreciate, we learned more about the rationale behind the reorganization than has been shared with the board prior to tonight. Mm -hmm. And it shed light on a lot of the questions that I had, and I wish that that had been shared in writing with us previously. Um, of particular interest were the accountability measures that you mentioned for the new chief position, because why create a position if you're not going to hold that individual accountable for delivering the results that we want, which has been unanimously stated here tonight, which is safety and greater safety for our students. Um, I would like to see, and what I believe has been requested by my board colleagues, would be a position description with those accountability measures listed, um, documented in the responsibilities of that position. So I will be making the motion to table um, this tonight until we have that document and can review it to do our own due diligence. Not to say that this is not the direction we should be headed, but I would appreciate a little more information before making the decision. I would also, and thank you for that, I would also suggest that, and I would advise the board in, uh, that tabling the measure, I, uh, would, I would err on the side of caution to table uh, due to Ms. Causey's uh, concern. Again, we are at the beginning of the school year. It is a little bit late in the day, we know, but it is still an opportunity. Schools have not started yet. We still have time uh, to do this uh, properly and to get uh, communication not only to our schools but to our communities. By tabling, uh, we could be then starting the school year with one structure and then going in um, later on with another structure, which I don't think is sound practice. Mr. Young and then Mrs. Miller. Safety has come up quite a bit as the number one priority. What I see here is the opportunity to pull two sides of the same house together to work closer without having to go up one side down the other. What I'm also hearing is that because we weren't intimately involved in an operational change of how things are being done. We want to delay an opportunity to have groups work together for more and better safety for our students. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, 
I think Mr. Hayden's point uh, has merit. Um, this is the first that we have heard about this. Um, I don't think that the board has enough information to really know how this is going to functionally play out for our system. And we're being asked to consider two very separate things. There is a sweeping structural reorganization to the top levels of our administration. And then there is the school safety new uh, department. Um, I think if we broke this into two separate motions, it, we might find it easier to pass one side of that than the other. Um, I like several aspects of the change with regard to the reorganization, uh, the move back to the geographic areas and the feeder programs, the, fe the feeder pattern, um, which is why, what, two years ago, I voted against that change. Um, and I do like the elevation of safety as the primary focus. I believe uh, we all do. Um, however, I'm not going to support this tonight and, and that the whole idea that this is urgent, we got to do it now, it just rings hollow. We've heard that over and over and over where things are brought to us at the last minute and then it's a rush. And even though we don't have a lot of information, we have to vote it through now. At some point, the board needs to say, we're not gonna operate that way anymore. That's a severe deficiency in the way that we're operating. Um, the main reason that I don't want to support this for tonight uh, is, um, like I said, this is a huge structural change to our system. And I need to remind everyone that Ms. White is an interim. Her term ends in 10 months. We don't know what's going to happen next year or who will become our permanent superintendent. To make this kind of change now with a new board coming on in three months, is irresponsible. We really should allow for the new board to decide what kind of changes they want to make and see how this is going to play out. The role of an interim is to be a placeholder, not make big, broad changes. Um, the interim should be working on what exists now and trying to improve those things, improve reading and math comprehension and, and our discipline issues. So the urgency that's been expressed by the public that we've all heard was not this call for a reorganization. It was a call for discipline to start to be administered in our schools. So I would support Ms. Hen's motion or I would support um, a flat out no at this time. Mr. Stewart and then Ms. Adekoya. So I am very pleased that our current interim superintendent is not of the view that her position is merely as a caretaker of this community. This community has needs and they need to be addressed now. We have heard them, I have heard them. And to say that that's what our children deserve, which is just holding on for another year at a time, I think is nonsensical. I think we need leadership in our system and I'm glad we have uh, Verlita White at the helm. And in any event, I think we're moving in the right direction as we do this, regardless of what the next board would be thinking about or regardless of what uh, following superintendent would think about. We know that there's an issue. We need to start addressing it now to say, let's just hold on. Let's sit on this again and again. It's what we kind of say uh, or what we hear regularly as a board. Uh, I think that's a mistake in, in the approach. And then finally, I think this gets back to this board believing that its job is ultimately to run our system um, on the day-to-day -day basis and on the leadership and responsibility basis. Uh, having a certain flexibility in the arrangement of responsibilities and how the inner workings of central office uh, may go uh, might be one of those things that we need to respect, at least as it relates to the expertise and experience uh, of the people involved. Um, we ought to have a little, a little bit of balance when it comes to those things. Ms. Adekoy and then Mr. Yulefelder. Um, I personally do not believe you have to wait for the new board in a sense that
to wait for the new board, nothing will get done. The new board is not expected to come till December. So many issues and problems can affect this, the children by the first day. So do you continue to wait for the new board before you make decisions pertaining to the children? As well as I learned today at MABE that the position of the board is the what and the why, and then the position of the superintendent is the how and the, ooh, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> the how and the when. So if you believe that as a superintendent, she does not have, she has the role of a caretaker in a sense, what is the essence of her position? Mr. Yulfelder. Thank you. You know, successful organizations or entities have a couple things in common. Number one, they have a visionary leading them. Number two, they're mobile. And by what I, what I mean by mobile is the ability to change based on the changes and the conditions that are in the present environment. Uh, we have a very talented administrative staff. Uh, we have a talented woman heading this organization. And it seems to me the comments, the negative comments I hear, are, are those who think they know more about education, they know more about structure, they know more about organization, and it's particularly an organization as large as this one than the superintendent and her staff. I'll be very honest with you. Those who, who don't see the value of doing this now, to me, are obstructionists. If this program is not successful, we'll know about it at some point in time. And if it's successful, we'll know about it also. So who are we to tell the administrative staff and the superintendent that we know more about putting this organization together, about the delivering the services that we hear everybody wants than, than our staff? I think it's ridiculous. Board, it's our job. I, didn't, I didn't interrupt you, so you keep your mouth shut, if you don't mind. Thank you. All right, are we ready to vote? Mrs. Eaton and Mrs. Hen. As a board, we're not here to hold Mrs. White's hand or her staff's hands. They're educated people. They've been in education for most of their lives. They know what decisions to make. They know much more than I do. We're here to help facilitate them to pass whatever they want to have if we think it's pr appropriate. I agree with Nick, and I'm sorry I still can't pronounce her name. <laughs> Miss Atacoya. That's it? <laughs> <laughs> And I agree that we can't keep waiting until December for things to happen. If we're going to do that, we might as well not show up then and just have the new board come in December and we have a seat. All right, Mrs. Hen. Thank you. We're being asked to approve not any position, but a key leadership, executive leadership position, one of the most important positions in this system. There's no doubt that this is necessary, but we haven't even received so much as a job description for this position. What are the responsibilities? How will that individual be held accountable to meet the goals that set about for this position? I'm making the motion to table it so that we can get more information to make an informed decision, not to manage Mrs. White or her team, but to do our due diligence in understanding that the creation of this position is what this board feels we need to, to take in order to meet our school safety goals. All right, there's a motion to table. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Um, is that discussing or not? Um, it's actually, I mean, in theory, it's a motion to postpone, not a motion to take. Okay. So any, uh, all right, so hold on. There's a motion to postpone or to table and a second. You want to be heard on that? Yes, please. Very good. I'd like to propose. Um, hold on, you have to speak on the motion to postpone or table, not propose yes. something else. Yes. My comment on the current motion is that it's not, this or nothing. It's not the superintendent's it, the, uh, org chart or nothing. Um, I think that we can table this or postpone it, as Mr. Nussbaum pointed out, to next week. Call a special meeting, have everyone evaluate this information that we've received and the additional information um, that we've requested where we can have it in writing to reflect on it, but also to um, talk to additional stakeholders and talk to each other and then call a special meeting and, and vote on it next week before school starts. We have called special meetings before to vote on specific issues. We had a situation where we needed to enact a lease 
to uh, develop a property for swing space for schools during a construction process we had. Uh, I guess it was two or three years ago. Um, and I think that that would be the reasonable thing to do, to allow people to reflect the board who is supposed to govern the school system, who is supposed to decide on the programs of education, to make sure that there are no unintended consequences of rushing this through um, unnecessarily. I do, of course, believe in school safety, and I'm glad that uh, okay. the comments of the board members that have amplified the community's concerns have brought this organization chart to fruition, but it is still inappropriate, in my opinion, to ask the board to vote on information right. that it has, in fact, not just received, but have not received yet. So I would suggest to the board okay. that we can do that, okay. that we can table this and that we can call a special meeting because I do agree if it is going to be implemented, it should be done before the school year if possible. So, um, Very good. but that doesn't uh, mean it can't happen later than that also. Mr. Young. I'm against the motion to postpone. Um, as my colleague has pointed out, they feel that this is rushed and they have concerns about this being implement it even if we approve it tonight. So to turn around and say, let's delay it, that would truly make it really rush to implement before the start of the school system, the start of the school year. There's no need to delay, in my opinion. We have, we have the framework for what's gonna happen. We know what the um, Department of School Safety currently does. We know what the um, other departments that are being pulled out of academic services. We know what they do. We know that they're responsible for the, the social and emotional welfare of students. We already know what they do. We're trying to pull them closer together so that they work more in unison. There's no need to delay. Mrs. Hen, and then we'll vote on the motion to postpone. Thank you. So this motion doesn't postpone indefinitely. There are no adverse consequences by delaying to receive more information. It's simply to request that information to do our due diligence to make an informed decision as a board. There are several questions that have been um, posed that have not received responses. Some have been answered tonight. Um, we need to get those responses in writing. We need a little bit more meat on the bones here to make um, an informed decision. This is not to say this is not an excellent plan. It's we don't have enough information to answer the question. The motion is to postpone the vote on the proposed organization as shown in H1. All in favor of that motion to postpone, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Opposed? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Uh, the motion fails. Now the motion is to approve the proposed organization changes for the 2018 school year as presented in Exhibit H1. All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Opposed? One, two, three. Mrs. Causey? I am abstaining because I All have right. not received information in writing right. that I requested. And while I am the, very no, grateful that no, we are focusing no need, on safety. No need to expa expound, you abstain. Next okay. on the agenda is uh, action taken in closed session. We invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Good evening again. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered three appeals regarding confidential employee and student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. These three appeals were considered on the record as there were no requests made for oral argument by any of the three appellants. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in closed session in those matters which were summary affirmance uh, numbers or hearing examiner numbers 18-48, 18 18-53, 18 and 18-61. We'll do them one at a time. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken on 18-48? So Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Opposed? Abstain? Abstain. One, two, three. Excuse and me, I had one where I was recused. Where this was it. This, this was it. This Recuse. The right. motion carries. The next yes. is... Yeah, I'm, I'm likewise a... I'm likewise a recusal on the... 18-48. Um, yeah. All righty. I'm uh, abstaining on, on all three. Right. Next, okay, next is 18-53, the motion to approve the action taken in closed session. Please raise your hands. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oppo um, opposed. Abstain. One, two. Uh, um, and okay, that passes. And um, Mrs. And, Miller, that was three. All right, and, and, and the last, she's not here, so we don't, but there was enough votes to pass. And last is 18 61, all in favor of the action uh, taken in closed session, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Opposed? Abstain. One. That motion carries as well. Thank you, Mr. Thank Nussbaum. you very much. Uh, the orders are on the table if you all can sign. Yeah, everyone need to sign those orders before the end of the evening. Next is um, item J, uh, proposed policy changes. I invite uh, Mr. Virch to speak. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Ed. Um, Mr. Chair and members of our board, our Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asked that our board accept this report of the uh, uh, the committee's approved proposed amendments to the following board policies. Policy 7240, school site selection and acquisition. Policy 7310, determination of school design and construction costs. These recommendations are presented to you on our agenda as Exhibit J. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? So moved. No seconds required. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Birch. You are most welcome. Next on our agenda, um, state capital budget, item K. Uh, Mr. Smith, Mr. Dixit, Mr. Saris. And as these uh, gentlemen are coming forward, I just want to, uh, again, thank the board for your openness and for your questions. And I'd like to thank our staff uh, for developing the responses. As you know, the board has a week to develop questions. We also have a week to develop de responses um, before the board has to vote. Uh, on September 11th, the board would have had the responses or would have had an opportunity to review the budget for over a month. And so we want to be able to honor that timeline and address um, current practices, again, where we are currently with our capital program, as well as address the capital program overall. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Um, it is indeed an honor for um, um, my colleagues and I to join you today to uh, delve into our work session related to our FY20 capital uh, request, state capital request. This request, um, most if not all of the projects on this request have had ample discussion from community, um, this board and uh, our state and local funding agencies. We're excited about where we are. Um, at the last meeting we discussed the schedule of what, how this process goes. As you can remember, this is a fluid process that goes through multiple levels of review and approval at both the local and the state level as well as this board. Um, um, the vote will be, um, for this vote will be September 11th. And with that, I want to turn it over to Mr. Dixie, who's going to give two parts to a presentation. One, sort of the state of where we are related to our, where we've come from to this point, to where we are with the capital plan that's presented, proposed to you today. Mr. Dixie. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And good evening, Chairman Gell Gillis, uh, Vice Chair Stewart, uh, Madam Superintendent, and members of the board. As Mr. Smith indicated, this is the time of the year when I provide a summary of uh, work that we have done for school opening and that, that leads into the uh, process of capital improvement program. As part of the summer program and as the new school year starts, uh, our school readiness includes uh, in extensive cleaning, summer cleaning of all school buildings. The process entails deep cleaning of all schools and preventive maintenance of mechanical equipment, which is on schedule for teachers to come back on October, on August 22nd. Uh, the ground shop has completed all the mowing and has done a uh, lot of work, concrete work for paving bus loops and parking lots at 10 schools, concrete sidewalks at eight schools. Approximately 46 trees have been removed repaired fencing at 75 schools and other work related to SAD. Logistics department, which is in charge of uh, moving the furniture 
to get the schools ready, the new schools and any modification in the existing program. They have been actively involved, and especially for the opening of three new elementary schools, they have been involved with moving the furniture, uh, unloading uh, 16 tra trailers of uh, stuff and 800 pallets of supplies, and about 27 full days of moving services. Maintenance department has been extensively involved in reducing the backlog of work. The backlog has reduced by 38% since January the 1st of 2018. And also we have in, uh, completed about 400 work requests, accelerated the work to complete that work request for safety related work items. Uh, energy performance contracting, as board will recall, board has approved three different energy performance contract in amount load totaling $132 million. Phase one was completed a couple of years ago in 2015-2016 and has <coughs> realized $2.4 million of savings annually. An additional savings of 306000 has been realized in addition to what the board approved as part of the guaranteed savings. Phase two is 95% complete, and phase three is 75% complete. These phases are projected to be completed by September 2018 and February 2019. These projects combined together have improved energy efficiency at 152 schools and provided uh, alternative funding for air conditioning installations at six middle schools, five elementary schools. In the construction and improvement area, since this is the last board meeting for a lot of you here, I'd like to capture the summary for the last five, six years of what we have done. Our Schools for Future program started in 2011. Eight new elementary schools have been contracted constructed, and eight additional schools are slated to be completion for 2021. This will provide 21st century learning environment to 11,000 students. Five elementary schools, um, additions and renovations have been constructed, and one Scott's branch uh, elementary school, the addition is in the process to be completed by 2021. Two high schools have undergone uh, extensive renovations, Pikesville and Her Hereford High School, and uh, additional two high schools, Patapsco and Woodlawn, are in the process of being completed. <coughs> One middle school, Dumbarton Middle School, has gone through extensive renovation and is complete, and one new, new middle school in the northeast area is in the early stage, uh, early planning stages three new schools opening this year, it hasn't happened in 20 years. And when it did happen, the score footage was less than half of what we are doing this year. And there was no technology, there was no air conditioning, and there was not modern 21st century educational environment. In addition to this, 525 uh, infrastructure improvement projects have been completed since 2011. An accomplishment in the air conditioning have been transform transformational. It is totally game changing. Starting with 90 schools in 2011, we have completed 73 additional schools for air conditioning, uh, taking to a total number of 163 schools that are air conditioned. Nobody ever imagined that we'll be able to do that, but we did that. In terms of the impact on learning, 51,000 additional students now have the benefit of air conditioning because of what we have been able to do together in the last six years. The total capital expenditure during this time has been in excess of $1.2 billion. Uh, this $1.2 billion program has been on schedule within budget, which is uh, not very common if you read newspapers on any $1 billion program. I do like to express my gratitude to Superintendent White, who has been extremely supportive, and Mr. Smith. They have 
provided us the leadership, the positive reinforcement, and given us, me and my team, the professional freedom that we needed. They didn't tell us this is what is needed. They let us decide what is good for the kids. And uh, I'm extremely grateful for that. Uh, obviously, efforts of this magnitude is uh, not done by one person. Uh, I couldn't get the whole team here, but some of the key members that are here, uh, and I'd like to name them, please stand up and I call your name, Merrill Plate. He is my right-hand person on the construction and improvement area, director of construction and improvement. <laughs> Mike Archbold, who couldn't be here. Is he here, Mike Archbold? Yeah, he is our uh, top. <laughs> He's our architect who has been helping Merrill and me. Uh, Al Albacher, he's the father of performance contracting for us. <laughs> this is right here. Chris Robert is the director of building operations. He's been responsible, his team have been responsible for cleaning. One of the new members of the team is the manager of log logistics. Miss Liz Becker, if it wasn't for her and her team, we wouldn't have furniture and all the, all the equipment <laughs> that we have in so many schools. <laughs> if you have been to campuses and you see this green, well-mowed campuses, it's Chris Blasetti and her team, and she'll be here. Paul Taylor and Scott Welsh, our director and manager of support services, couldn't be here because they're taking care of children and grandchildren, but they are just as much important and they played an important role. With that, um, this is the facilities update. Um, we had presented to you the changes in the capital improvement program in the last meeting. And uh, uh, if you didn't uh, get that or if some of you are not here, I'll be more than glad to share that with you. But before I do that, um, I wanted you to know that the board had sent lots and lots of questions, and we have provided response in writing to all the questions. My understanding is that they'll be posted on the website. They were posted yesterday. Uh, okay, they, they'll be posted uh, very soon. In addition to that, I wanted to provide you with the schedule of where we go. What you'll be approving in the next meeting is the state portion of the capital improvement program. Um, board will vote in, on September uh, 11th meeting, and we submit it to state on October 4th. The first round of result, which they call 75%, it comes to us in November. Um, the the governor announces preliminary capital budget in November uh, of 2018. Interagency committee meeting, which is the approval for the first round, is December 31st, 2018. And then we come back to you uh, introducing the county budget for FY 2020. And that will be in December 2018. Uh, board workshop will be in December 2018 for the county portion of this capital budget. Board will vote in January 2019 for the county capital program. And while all of that is going on, the second round of state recommendation, which is what we call 90%, they'll come to us in March 2019, and the third round being in May 2019. Legislature approval is in May 2019, and final letter approval comes in June 2019. As you can see, this is a long process and it's a complex process. We'll keep the board informed um, at just about every step. And the document that you're seeing for the state submittal is a, is a moving, it's a, it's, a, it's a document that is adjusted as we get more data. The data comes in the form of state's processes, their review, and review by the county fiscal partners. With that marks the end of my presentation. We'll open the floor to the chair for any Very additional good. response. I'll remind everyone this is a work session and we'll have this come up to us again for a vote in, in uh, September 11. But now it's time for questions by the board to, um, to these uh, great panelists. Mr. Virch. 
Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for appearing. I couldn't resist um, um, a, a bit of laughter uh, when um, uh, Pete was kind enough to uh, remind us who may have gotten a swollen head after the last vote that, in fact, this will be the last time that we have this uh, uh, kind of work session on the state <laughs> budget. Um, it, it had never occurred to me. Um, if I might just take you to the first item, uh, which is uh, uh, servicing schools in the Perry Hall area, uh, the Honeywell Elementary School project, I just wanted to verify that, in fact, that project is on schedule on schedule and schools will open and that school will be ready and I know that Charlene Benke is just on that and she is knocking that out um, with regard to the Northeast area elementary school over on Ridge Road in our sixth district um, if you could just very briefly uh, sketch a timeline just very briefly, recognizing that there are a lot of variables. We have a new county executive. The, the county council will have some turnover. Uh, what uh, sort of um, timeline do you have for that new proposed it's elementary school? What we are, what we are uh, projecting at this time is the 2020 mm -hmm. uh, opening for that. So it's in the early stages of design. And that's actually the second half, so to speak, of addressing overcrowding in that northeast corridor. Uh, with the opening of Honeywell Elementary School, uh, that helped provide some relief, but there's still more relief that's been needed. And it's always been very, you know, you know, the system's been very transparent about it, that one new elementary school there would not be enough. And this is the second one to address that piece. That doesn't solve for the rest of that, a little further uh, to the south uh, of that, but it, it is, it's a huge it's a huge benefit. Uh, right. uh, going down to the new Northeast Area Middle School, um, I um, I took a I, I said uh, made a brought to the attention of my uh, seatmate uh, Chuck that the state share uh, proposed share of this project is f over forty one million dollars. Yeah. Based on your knowledge, your training, and your experience, because uh, I used that, that term earlier tonight. What are you looking at as the as the, the 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 final estimated cost at this juncture? Recognizing that things can change, we do not uh, we do not like to share the cost in advance. For one thing, we don't know for sure, and the second thing is we'll be at a competitive disadvantage if we talk about the total cost. Sure, because in terms of how folks would bid. Yeah. But if I was to use, but I could do my own math and I could say the state share might be 38% and then I could like come up with some kind of 62% uh, equivalent for local county funding. But uh, that's not yet, um, that's just one way of looking at it and it's just one narrative. Now it's for 14, it's over for, it's for over 1,400 students. And um, in part, uh, there's the, the, the very pressing need that's existed at our Perry Hall Middle School. Yeah. But there's also that school just down the road that opened in, I want to say, in like 1928. Mm. Uh, the, and I have to say it, the original Kenwood High School, although I did not attend it, uh, that uh, also has had numerous additions put on it. But uh, my understanding is that it's really that the addition of students from that school that with the uh, overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle School and projected increases in middle school students that then get us to a critical f figure of students for the purposes of justifying mm -hmm. a new Northeast Middle School. Is that right? That is correct. With the, okay. with the um, inclusion as well of the Pine Grove Middle School project as well to help address our middle school seats comprehensively in the area. Yeah, and, and we're on the same page because you can't be going to two middle schools at once. Right. So yeah, right. Um, then directing your attention further down our list to necessary improvements in our sixth district, Chase Elementary School, the boiler replacement, and um, just below that is Elmwood Elementary School, also in our 6th District, and Seneca Elementary School, the Chiller Replacement. Now, you've spoken with us before about these uh, important um, building infrastructure improvements, roofs, boilers. These projects themselves, I, I want to ask you, what time frame can you estimate for these three schools receiving these improvements? Last time I tried to 
dude, I gave you wrong information, <laughs> and I didn't want. I didn't. That was that, that, that was a year ago, and I still remember it, buddy. And I remember the phone call afterwards too. <laughs> so. The and the email thing, afterwards. The best thing I can share with you that after the funds are approved, it takes anywhere from six to eight months to design it and get all the state approvals. And then it takes another six months, eight months to go through the bidding process and construction and complete the construction. So if you add 12 to 14 months from the date of approval, assuming everything goes right, that's what we're talking about. The triggering event would then be the state agreeing to fund yes. its portion of those three schools improvements is that right yes Correct. all right and uh, that other school that project that's still on schedule is that right the one from last year that we discussed and i got the phone call and then the and then there was the follow-up email about and and i gave you the revised schedule and that revised schedule is still good very good all right thank you so much mcdaniels Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Um, I wanted to thank staff for answering the questions that were submitted. I got a lot of uh, update from that. Um, one area I still seem to be unsettled about um, has to do with the high school replacements that are listed there. And uh, it's been explained to me that the timing of the decisions made by this board have influenced the order in which th some of these things show on this list, perhaps. Um, the concern that still rings with me, though, is that the last objective information that was presented to this board way back when we were looking at the renovation of four schools indicated that Lansdowne High School physically was pretty much in the worst condition at the time of the evaluation than pretty much any high school um, that is in Baltimore County. And then I and attended one of the high school uh, study outreach meetings, and a comment was made by one of the SAGE people that the board had decided to do a replacement at Delaney High School. So it, information seems to be leaking out to the community about decisions that the board has made. And then I see this document, which will just be another piece of what goes out. and. Um, we don't think that all three high schools are going to be built at the same time or year. Somebody's going to get built first. And um, I just get unsettled when I see the school that I saw as the worst condition high school is the lowest on this list for replacement. And it was explained in the answers that the high school study could affect this. But even with all that, I just um, am uncomfortable that you know a whole bunch of new people will be sitting at this board new county executive will be involved and somehow it could look like this a board has chosen this priority and I don't know I'd like to see some asterisks by it or something but I just I'm just uncomfortable that it implies some priority that we've consciously made to the school order my response to your question would be we serve the will and pleasure of the superintendent and the superintendent serves the will and pleasure of the board. This capital plan reflects every motion that was approved by this board and whatever actions that take place thusly. So the, what, you, what you see here is exactly what was voted on. However, the board also voted on having a high school study that, uh, that would address, that would look at our high school seats comprehensively. So as Mr. Dixon stated earlier, this is a fluid document. This document is fluid, it, it moves. So um, as more information from the high school study and further conversations with this board or future boards, as well as our funding agencies could impact how the capital plan moves from there. So I don't want you to think that, you know, I know your concerns, you shared that with me on m multiple times, but what we have to do is make sure that we, uh, honor what the board's requests were as it relates to the to the vote what we caution at that time is when you put items on without any funding it doesn't necessarily look like that on the capital plan it is it's on once it's on it's on and you can move it off as the board's will so so I, I my follow-up question is is your impression along with the superintendents that this is the order that this board has prioritized the replacements of the school. This is what was voted on by the board. The priority list is how it is ranked here, but this is how it was voted in the at, at the board meetings, the subsequent board meetings. 
Um, it was based on Ms. Causey's motion at the time um, to, um, and I can't remember, the, recall the date exactly, but that was the motion. Although I believe the, the numbers um, were, did not necessarily she matter. She indicated numbers. 27 and 28, but it was actually the numbers were all but. and 26, right. so but that, that was the that was motion and that was what was approved. Right. Mr. Stewart. So, and well, then Mrs. Miller. My recollect is that that was in the order of time in which yeah. they were voted on as well. Right. Which I think is a significant contributing factor. And so to the extent that this board wanted to at a later meeting, because we're not making motions and voting tonight, have an asterisk to indicate to the future board, this is not necessarily an indication of where we believe they come in the process that could be indicated. And that this is contingent upon the uh, results of the high school study. Like we'll have an asterisk motion at the next meeting. I think that would make some Mrs. sense. Mrs. Miller. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just to add on to that, I think that the board didn't maybe put as much into it because the projects were being forward funded. So we thought, well, they're all going to go through. So the priority maybe wasn't as much of an urgency, I think, to us. But my questions are about forward funding. Um, I, I have concerns about how that works out. Um, so I, I, I actually have some questions first about last year so that we can see what has played out and that impacts the decisions we make going forward. Um, was there some funding denied by the state for any of the projects that were forward or promised to be forward funded last year? Not that I know of. I'm not aware of any, but I mean, once again, we, we would have to go back and check each individual one, so we, we would have to reserve that, that we're, not that we can remember right now. And um, which projects were promised forward funding last year? Was it the entire list? Well, the, the forward, that, this is a little tricky for us because the forward funding piece is not something that's done by the schools. That's right. a county process, right. so I, I get uneasy about speaking for what the county does as it relates to that. I know that. Oh, what they did, they promised forward funding. Right. So I'm asking, what did they promise? The, the, the best way I can say it is the projects that we have listed here in our capital plan on, on this capital, well, the FY19 capital plan, they were a part of the forward funding um, um, formula that they used. So from, from Schools for Our Future. So those were the projects that were full funded. Um, the, the list of them, I, I, I couldn't tell you what they are because that's something that they do on their funding model that we don't necessarily um, are involved in that process, the funding model for the county. And when they promise forward funding, is there some document that guarantees that? What does that mean that they have promised forward funding? Well, when the, when the capital plan goes forward, there's a letter that goes from the county executive basically saying the items on the capital plan that has been submitted by the Board of Education and the, the county executive sort of uh, agrees that these are the projects that I agree to support or not. So there be instances where they all agree to do X number and not the other ones, but they state that in the letter. So that's one of the documents that indicates whether or not that the, the county is supporting the capital plan as it moves forward, whether that's forward funding or not. But those forward funding promises were made prior to last year's state request. Some of them were. So so then we get the state request back mm -hmm. and they will tell us which that they're going to fund. Correct. And that might change things for the county. The county could then come back and say, well, this isn't what we were expecting. There's nothing that guarantees <coughs> that forward funding. Is that correct? I, I just want to say two things about that. When we started schools for our future program, county agreed to forward fund the entire program based on the schedule that a state approves it. I've been working with county folks for a long time, and they have always been cooperative. They have always done what they said they would do. When we need adjustment, if the funding is here and there, in the past we have worked closely with them. They understand why adjustments are needed, and they have never said that they wouldn't do it. So. In my mind, if they said that they will forward fund schools for future program, they will. You know, that's my opinion. 
Does that promise carry through to the new county executive? That part I don't know. We can't speak. I we can't, can't speak to that. And council, really? I, yeah, I mean, I they're all going to be new. Right. We can't speak to that. But um, past history has indicated that the projects that the county executive and the county council has agreed to support, they have done that based on our past history. But so here we are a few months before an election, and there's promises again this year. But we don't really know what's going to happen next year. But but to that point, the election. Th those promises help happen every year during the capital, the CIP program. So, I mean, you, you, what you're saying is accurate, but that happens every single year when we propose something. They have to make promises to the state and to the local that either the projects they're going to support or not. I'm sure Mr. Hayton is aware of that. And then as the funding becomes materialized, they decide what they can do and what they can't do. But I would suspect that they're not going to. They're not going to agree to do something that they don't have funding to do in some way, shape, or form, whether it's state reimbursement or the local dollars as well. So this happens every year, so I don't want you to... But the uh, election doesn't, so this year is a little bit different. There, I'm just pointing I, out I, to the board that there is a little more precariousness about what we're doing this year as far as this forward funding. Plus, forward funding is not typical. I mean, that's only been the last two years. No, they they forward they, they forward fund just about every year. I think the not the whole list. The I mean, th what this what made unusual. this interesting was that the amount of forward funding has become pretty significant. Yeah. So that's yes, ma'am. And, and I would like to say that the the idea that they uh, I've got to plug in or I'm going to lose my computer. <laughs> yeah. The idea that. Um, that they were going to forward fund the whole list did impact the way we looked at our prioritization. It did for me. Um, so, but I just wanted to make that point. Um, to, to move on, um, still on last year though, I, I've been getting some input regarding some of the renovations from last year, um, specifically Woodlawn and Patapsco, saying that they're, um, uh, actually, even more than that, Catonsville Elementary, Relay, and Dumbarton, um, saying that there appears that there were significant change orders. The class sizes are smaller than what was in the plan. Um, this is what I'm hearing. Um, okay. And that there are cosmetic improvements where things were supposed to be um, rehabbed down to the studs. Uh, also, I'm hearing um, the classrooms only have one door. I don't know if you know that's typical or not, or if, if it's the new norm. Um, can you speak to that? Were there change orders? Okay. Um, I don't know where those rumors are coming from, and I don't know what's the basis of their rumor. What I can tell you, the board approved uh, a contract and board approved contingency amount. And we shared uh, design uh, with the board. There has been no change in the design that board approved. There has been no change in the contract amount within the contingency limit. There is no change in classroom size than what board approved. And if there ever will be, we'll come back and uh, we'll request your approval. There have been times in the past and there'll be times in the future where change order goes above the contingency amount. As part of the process, we come to you, we explain to you why we are requesting this approval, and you approve it, and then we move forward. So for significant changes like what I've just described, would that require change orders? Change order is part of the construction process. And, bo and this, th that is why board approves a 10% contingency so that we can handle those change orders. If the change order amount exceeds that board approved contingency, we come to you. We have to ask for approval. So for uh, changes like this, it would require change orders. Yeah, there if, would be some kind of documentation. Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I had asked, and, and, and it was addressed in the responses, but it wasn't really answered. So I'm going to just ask it again. Um, why is all the, um, the state funding requests that had been in the column for 2021, the outlier years, yeah. they're all now moved to the 2020 column? Why is that? Okay, th these are, uh, 
details. That, you know, there's a complex process involved. Every year, we come up with a new cost estimate based on the state's uh, per square foot construction factor. It changes. So the first column that you see gives you the total project cost based on that formula. Mm -hmm. Then every year, as part of the details and the big book that we submit to state, the state requires that we project um, cash flow for next two or three years, depending on the project. So the total project cost changes and the cash flows change. They eventually are part of our final submission. So there's nothing new here. We are not taking money out from any project, not putting in any other project. It's just part of the process. But we're asking for it all up front in one year rather than spreading it over several years. So I'm thinking that that could impact how much how many projects the state is going to get to if we're asking for it all up front? No, state requires that we provide them with the total cost of the project. project. When so the approval comes in, they are based on our cash flow because state is distributing that money to 24 LEAs and everybody's giving them their annual share of the cash, cash flow. So it's quite a detailed process. They have administrative guidelines they have processes and procedures, and the staff has been doing it for a long, long time, so they know exactly what they are. We are not trying to hide any information. We are not trying to change any information. So the fact that previously, this was from, this one is from May, yeah. there was a certain level of state funding request for 2020, <coughs> and it, then it, the rest, the remainder was broken out for 2021. Yeah. This year, the whole that whole thing is lumped into 2020. You're saying that's really not going to have any impact because the state will pay no, what the state will pay. No, because you don't see the cash flow for the next year. We have not done that yet. In the final thing that will be submitted to state, they'll have the total project cost and they'll have the cash flows that are being worked right now. I'm talking about the orange columns. Yeah. The requests. It's not about the total cost. That it's about the requests is, that we're making to the state. That request is for the total project cost. It doesn't, it, that is the total project cost. So I, the, I think that the May 2018 document that says final across it, uh, that's the second page in our attachment, mm -hmm. was just a draft, a first iteration of what we now have. It's not a submitted document because our submitted documents for the prior year were before the May 2018 date. So you're just looking at one iteration of a, a continuing process. Okay. okay. And that's inclusive of the cash flowing. That and when we come back to you. Thing broken yeah. out for, for the outline. Yeah, years. we haven't done that yet. After board approves this. This will year, change again. This will change again. Yes, and okay. then it will change again in December you know, when we come back to you for the county portion. Okay. Um, hold on. Now, for 2020, all of these projects are being promised forward funding? Those that will be approved, they'll be forward funded, yeah. Okay. Hang on. Um, Okay, I, I'm done for now. Mr. Young and then Mr. Uhlfelder. Okay, Mr. Uhlfelder. Okay, I, I like to bring some realism into this whole project. On this schedule here, uh, there are approximately um, 13 schools, either replacement or new. My rough calculation says we need about $810 million to build these schools. Uh, one of my questions is, has anybody sat down to talk to our county exe executive uh, nominees? Uh, where they're out there promising this, that, and the other thing. Where, where they expect to fund 800, and t uh, my round figures, $810 million. And you have to remember that the county portion of that is a small percentage. You know, if we get... 40, 50 million dollars a year from the county, we're getting a lot. So we're getting a small percentage of any cost. Does anybody realistically go into the two future or one of the two county executives and the county council and give them a, a little history lesson and tell them this is what we're facing? If these are, these are our needs to meet their population growth and our present um, enrollment, 
you need eight hundred and ten million dollars. I can tell you that the county is is uh, on watch by some of the credit uh, uh, some of the re credit rating rating agencies because apparently one of the main reasons the county does not have a large enough rainy day fund or reserves. So I I, I would like to get you know the, both of our potential county executives and the sit down and say. Here's what you're really facing. Don't go to school and say, we're going to build a new school. Because I don't know where the money's going to come from. And even tax increases aren't going to cover 810, probably anywhere between 800 and a billion dollars. So, I mean, realistically, uh, I don't know what the answer is, but I think we ought to be real clear that this is what we believe that we need for the future. And I don't know if the future's three, five, 10, or 20 years, but. If we're going to meet our objective of putting a seat for every kid, we, we better talk to someone about this realistically. Thank you, Any Mr. further Mr. questions Mayor. or comments for our panel? Mr. Stewart. Hey, panel. Let's chat about Chadwick and uh, Johnny Cake. Um, so I noticed in the questions it says that there will be 327 seats uh, added there. Uh, my understanding is that Chadwick is overcrowded by about 240 right now <clears throat> so we're between 80 and 90 is what we have i think <clears throat> excuse me as it relates to some relief that could be provided to johnny cake elementary which is overcrowded by 168 but obviously that doesn't get us all the way there and doesn't address dogwood elementary and some other uh, overcrowded schools as well so <clears throat> let me just say I mean, i've had a few conversations with our uh, administration as it relates to the issue i know that and this is the county government um, I know that we've talked about programmatic changes in the area that would help us with the numbers as well as maybe districting kids out of Johnny Cake into uh, other schools with additional capacity. But I wanted to see how far along we've gotten in some of those conversations and particularly about whether and to what extent, whether and what would be necessary uh, as it relates to capital money for Johnny Cake in particular. Um, certainly, the, those discussions about Johnny Cake are, are ongoing. Um, once again, we are sort of proposing the projects that we have now, and we will look at program needs as we move along as Chagwack becomes more of a reality, and we will look at whether or not that's programming offerings that we have to look at, or boundary, or, th and with the, um, inclusion of this project here, Johnny Cakes has just not risen to the point that it is um, uh, forwarded as a project based on the plan that the county, the, the schools for our future, it's not in that plan as we look at this now. So okay. it's ongoing, but. Uh, right, no, yeah. I understand that. But uh, being over capacity by that, uh, per, that number and it, really that percentage of that school, I mean, even when we were redistricting, you know, 11 different schools back in the day, uh, it was a severe problem at that time. And so, you know, obviously there's uh, an indication in the community, an indication in the process that there wasn't assistance provided to them at that point in time for a host of reasons. But now the question remains, how do we deal with this in a holistic way? And I think it doesn't sound like we have our arms around um, a definitive solution for Johnny Cake. And we, uh, based on the advocacy that's taking place in the community and this board here, um, the superintendent and our team have are having those discussions with our county and state funding agencies, but it's, uh, it is still ongoing, so. Right, it, it, it just seems to me that based off of the percentage and based off the quality of the facilities that that would rise a little bit in our calculations, but it seems that that's just not the case at the moment. Do we have a sense of why? It's just part of the discussions. Uh, uh, currently now, we're going to have to address Chadwick and try to give some relief to Johnny Cake with Chadwick and um, maybe some programming until we can get a, 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 a plan going further out that could potentially encompass a Johnny Cake as an option for some type of a project. And assuming that a new county executive came into office and was very interested in moving that, moving the needle as it relates to that project, that would be a helpful, a helpful influence. Am I right? The county is the funding agency, so I would think that would be a good place for that. So, yes, sir. Very good. I think to Mr. Yulfelder's point, those conversations will be critical moving forward, uh, and so we are in conversation, and hopefully. Um, we will have Johnny Cake on that list of our discussion um, items as well, so that um, 
uh, as again, well as other we can, schools too. We can see about the funding available. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would just like to thank our panel, um, Mr. Smith and Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit, you're talking about the past and how much has been accomplished together. And I personally want to thank you for all of your assistance in the work that's been done. It's been on the board the last over three years, not quite three and a half. Um, a tremendous amount has been done around facilities, and I'm grateful that community concerns were amplified. I'm grateful that discussions were had amongst the board members, with our county partners, with our state funding partners, and that we all agreed that priority had to be given to healthy and safe learning environments for our students. So I applaud you. I appreciate uh, the support of everyone on this board and all those out there, our funding partner, partners, elected officials, and the community advocates that have come forward sometimes for years in order to try and help us focus on what's safe and healthy for our students and also for our staff that operate in buildings that are um, frankly less than ideal. Um, in certain circumstances, but we're making progress and that's what this is about and that's what this work session is about is how can we make the best progress, the most progress for the most students and staff with the resources that we have available. So with that, I had a question about, um, and I appreciate the responses in writing um, that we've received. We did get them last night, um, so I have to review them more thoroughly and I appreciate that they're gonna be on the website for our stakeholders to be able to look at also. Um, Number two was a question about a 10-year capital plan, and uh, the response is, it's important, so I want to read it. BCPS currently has a facilities master plan, a facilities maintenance plan, and a six-year capital improvement plan. But in order to maintain transparency and direction, BCPS is also committed to exploring a multi-year capital plan. Development of a 10-year plan will require a considerable amount of time, investment, and collaboration with state and county partners. And I agree that it will require a considerable amount of time, but not an inordinate amount of time, not an impossible amount of time. Pointing back to Anne Arundel County Public Schools and their 10-year strategic plan, with their um, uh, vendor that they used, they were able with 400 and some thousand dollars within six months to incorporate a 10-year strategic plan that identified every need of the facilities, not just overcrowding, not just lack of air conditioning, not just, um, uh, building conditions, but also modernization of schools and all of the needs that were there and point developed of order, a 10-year plan. Point of order real quick. I'm not sure yes. anyone said it was impossible here. So to the extent that you're subscribing or having them uh, subscribe to that belief, I don't think that's accurate. Oh, I, I'm not suggesting anyone did say it. So I'm, thank you for that. Um, just, just so to, in any case. I think what we said here, and I don't mean to cut cross you, is you, you both are saying the same thing. We said it a while ago. To do a 10-year capital plan, which I, I think most of us all agree that that makes sense, it can only work if you have the superintendent, the CE, the Board of Education, and the County Council all on the same page. The task that we have is that's not always done quickly. So our answer, I'm glad you read it and I'm glad you guys comment. We're not, being a, we're not avoiding, we're, we're saying we know we have a transition of this board, a transition of the county board, a current CE who's gonna be transitioning. We can't tell you when that, I can't give you a timeline, so I'm glad you read it and understood it for what it was. We're not avoiding it, we wanna get into it. We've had the con discussions with the previous CE, we had, we're having the discussions per the direction of the superintendent with the current CE, and we will have that conversation with whomever becomes CE whenever that happens. So we're actively engaged in that, but there's steps that have to take place, and until we have all the parties in place, it's hard to get everyone to commit. To Mr. Smith's point, I do believe, and we are open to this, and we've had multiple discussions about uh, it, it, that type of a plan, a multi-year plan, would create, uh, I think, greater levels of transparency and priorita uh, prioritization um, of our projects. It does require the commitment, though, um, of our county and state partners. But we are open to that uh, because we don't want anyone to believe that we are 
kind of playing any type of game um, with the community. And so as a level of commitment to the community, particularly when it comes to trust, um, and we know that we need to um, maintain the, the community's trust, we are open to a multi-year plan. It's just a matter of making sure that we're um, doing it in the best timing so that we have all of the the important, uh, the key decision makers on board um, for to that end. And thank you very much for the for the for jumping in and with the clarification because the point is is you're not the limiting factor, interim superintendent, not the limiting factor. But as Mr. Ufelder pointed out, there are in this election people that are potentially the limiting factor. And the point is for stakeholders that are concerned about their communities and their facilities to to look and ask questions. What is important? What is going to happen? How are, are we going to pay for this? Absolutely. So. And, and certainly, you all want to build new schools. I know that. I hear it all the time. You all are able to build new schools, to renovate schools that can be renovated. So there is a tremendous amount of capacity in our system. What I feel and have been saying is that we do need all those partners on board, and the time is now to yes, get them all to make a commitment. Um, so moving along then to... Um, the list, and I'll just go down the things. I was glad to hear the answers of um, Lock Raven High School and the uh, roofing that's going to take place there. Uh, Pine Grove Middle, I'm glad to see that the um, issues that we, the questions that I sent in, that those are being discussed as being part of the scope. And for that community, they can go online and look at the questions and the answers that are there. And just to speak about, uh, to a moment, to Mr. McDaniels and uh, Mr. Stewart in talking about the prioritization of Delaney, Towson, and Lansdowne High School, which I personally believe they all three need replacement schools, as I have said, and as uh, is evident by the motions that I've made and uh, for Mr. Stewart, the motions that I've supported. Um, in terms of the, the timing of who goes first, there's many criteria. Right now, we're talking about overcapacity as a primary goal, condition of the buildings. Um, for Towson and Delaney, it has always been my um, preposition because, of, supposition because of the information that I've gathered from you all, from the communities, from personal visits and, and, and research, um, that they need to be planned together because Towson is having incredible overcrowding. And if Delaney can be part of the help in that in terms of absorbing some of the capacity in a larger size school. That's one thing that can be designed. It, can, it also, in terms of timing, we already know that Delaney High School, with its 43 acres, has a site that's well suited to build a replacement school while the students are in their current building. Whereas Towson has some issues with the size that it's going to be, an the compact size, and the <coughs> environmental issue of the stream that's running through it. Um, so those two, in my mind, have always needed to be planned together. The other option that should be planned, or evaluated during planning is if Delaney builds a replacement school and those students move to the new school, that's a whole school swing space available for Towson. And one of the things that's talked about now is the historic aspects of Towson. Maybe they need to keep portions of the building that are historic, um, and then it would be more of a renovation in place if they can't find a place to move the kids. And I can tell you as a parent who had two students live through a renovation in place, um, it's not easy. And it's not easy when you have a campus in the middle of farmland and cornfields and a lot of room uh, to maneuver, much less on a very small campus. So a renovation in place can be disruptive to the programs of education and to the neighborhoods. It can be dangerous, it can be expensive, and it also can take a longer time. So that's always been uh, my, um, the concept of why they need to be planned together. The, the other thing we need to figure out for Lansdowne is to do that feasibility study of the site. Is the site capable of building the replacement school? If not, then we have to look at other factors of where would other land be that would be available. There's a whole lot of factors that need to be considered that because of the timing have not yet been. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is um, the, uh, the other issue with the Delaney High School is we do have another bank site that's being used as recreation that's almost 20 acres that could be used as um, parking, 
so the students and teachers can be shuttled in and out, especially if we use uh, part of Delaney as a swing space. So there's some extra land there that can be, that can be used. Um, the question that I had related to um, the county council is uh, there was a comment about the county council had, uh, was not addressing planning money. And I wanted someone to expand on that because it's my understanding that the planning money is already approved by the county council when they approved the budget that county executive candidates had put forward. My understanding is that the comments were that the state does not fund planning. That's correct, but right. there was a comment in here about um, relating to the <clears throat> county council. It relates to the timing of the Delaney project as well. I think that's what they're trying to get after was this notion that there hasn't been much progress in that conversation because the county council has put a hold on it after things happen in a certain type of way or perceived way by the county executive. And my question is what documentation is there that the county council has changed what's in the budget that was approved by the county executive, approved by the county council, and then put in place? Um, right. It was the, the budget has not changed. What has changed is the county council's action to, to delay the, the planning dollars for two, for two high schools until the new county council comes on board of the new CE. So um, for us, we are kind of in a holding pattern until for, in another, in another aspect, we're in a holding pattern until the comprehensive high school study can be done. So the, the funding, for, as I understand it, is still there. It's just been suspended based on the action of the county council from the budget message that we heard. Please forward to the full board of the written documentation that you're referring to about the county it's council. It's posted on county government's website, the council budget message, May 28th. If you could just forward that to the board, that'd be great. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask questions about is in the uh, multiple responses about the projections, because the projections are vital in terms of us understanding where we have the needs for seats. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't really clarified why the numbers had changed so dramatically for Towson going up. So I'm wondering, did they use transfer codes? Did they... Dr. Brown what? is coming forward that's going to How share. exactly are they projecting that? I mean, the cohort survival method doesn't <coughs> answer all of the aspects of um, capacity. So I believe this was answered in, in the written responses uh, to the board. Um, the, the model is a cohort survival model. It also takes into, thank you, also takes into account um, planned development. I think those were both articulated in that. And for the three schools that were inquired, uh, two of the schools have enrollments that have been declining for two years. So if you have fewer kids coming in and you look at a survival of a cohort over time, then the projections will decline. And in the case of Towson, if you have more kids coming in, then over time the projections will increase. You also have more multifamily residents being developed in the Towson area. I think that, again, was in the response. And anticipation of the yield of that also increases then uh, the projection for that area. So fewer kids in, fewer kids in the projection, more kids in, more kids in the projection. So in the, in the Towson area, are those yields, are those <coughs> documents available that can be shared with the board? The, the yield yields factor? of the new development or potential development? The yield factors for all areas of the county are available, yes. Okay, so is there a link on our high school capacity study for that, or is that one that can be shared with the board or shared with the community? Some of that's the county planning department. It, we've made it available to the county planning department. I believe it may be on their webpage. We had many of those documents on our webpage, but with the WCAG uh, compliance, we've sort of pulled back a little bit on that. That being said, the, the yield factor documents, one that uh, we can bring, I think we actually brought it to the board once before as an information item, and we could work to, to get. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, Thank other. Um, the last comment I wanted to make, and it's, um, it again dovetails with what Mr. Ufelder was speaking to in terms of the money, and we are 
analyzing and understanding that we have a lot of needs and they're not going to end with what we are talking about here because schools that were renovated before or built uh, before they are aging and so it's an ongoing process um, and in terms of the money right now we're in a position where he, we have spent over 160 million dollars on laptops for primarily elementary school and middle schoolers and then we're embarking on continuing the um, plan that was put in place uh, by the former superintendent providing very um, sophisticated laptops kindergarten through now high school 30,000 new devices are going online this um, this school year and that's going to be at a 51 million dollars a year cost and we'd gone through this in the budget so i'll just briefly say it there is an opportunity to align our technology expenses with what other districts are doing with what other recommendations are rather than the very expensive uh, laptops that we are doing and that is something that can be looked at um, in terms of being able to build the basics that we need for each child a roof over their head a seat clean air and clean water so I would hope that we can all look to that as we really evaluate the needs of the system mr. Birch thank you very much um, a roof sure but how about four walls and remember this is the team that put the word cool in 90 schools um, I would just ask you if I could, um, uh, when you uh, and I last spoke, you had uh, referenced elementary schools that would be projected to open in 2020. Directing your attention uh, to Drew Whitney School, Red House Run, which is on our list, I want to say maybe it's 22, I think it's in 22 and 23 uh, for planning for, for uh, funding. Um, is that one of the schools uh, that would be on a 2020 cycle or would that be um, a different schedule? We'll get that information. Sure, to absolutely, and uh, that would be a 700-seat school, is my recollection. And that's just true. That's yeah, true. and that's true. and um, with schools opening, we we had referenced Tunigo uh, in the Perry Hall area, but also is a school I attended for a year when there was no room at Hawthorne, our Victory Villa, and those students, um, uh, Marge Roberts students, are now attending. Uh, many of them had been attending until the school ended um, uh, at the old Rosedale school yes, sir. and uh, they're now making that move and as I said to Marge uh, just as you're ready to move into the new school you'll find all the stuff in the boxes that you couldn't find when you had to start <laughs> uh, two years earlier um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the new Red House run whatever might be that schedule and since it's a replacement school is the sense that those students would just ask with Victory Villa there is the Ro there is the old Rosedale Elementary School. Is that a place where they might attend? I know there's no decisions been made, but is that what the thinking is at this point? We're still exploring options, but certainly with having the Ro the R Rosedale property definitely creates some flexibility. So we'll still evaluate that as we move along in the project. Um, having been in it and uh, having walked in it, um, yeah, it's 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 showing its own age. And I mean, I know the the need for us to have that to have that roof, to have those walls, to have the other amenities that make education happen is important um, but you know that that school has that school needs work um, anyway I just want to thank you for your presentation tonight uh, I know there's a lot of information there uh, I do want to ask you this last question with regard to the state and when county government forward funds that then means county government's running the check and that then means the state because we would not have gone forward but for the state saying yes they will get their share to us have you sat and did a calculation as to what the projected transfers as of like this month, the to total amount of money the state has to bring back to Baltimore County that it has promised to send us over the years in the future? Do you know how much that totals? No, I don't know that off the top. Is it safe to say that it's easily in the tens of millions of dollars absolutely we average between 35 to 40 million dollars a year that comes from from state capital construction dollars yes sir. and and of that a portion of that is the state just re just not i won't say reimbursed but paying its share but it just wasn't able to pay it more timely when the project was underway our pressing need was so great that and we had the resources thankfully to be able to build now and then to have the state then come with its check later Correct. for its share 
Um, I know that you have a lot on your plate, and you are going to get back to me on another matter um, with regard to uh, Red House Run and its schedule. But um, I suspect that there's a, I won't say a balance book someplace, but I suspect that's a pretty easy amount to calculate and determine. We'll work through the superintendent for guidance on how we can proceed with that. That'll be fine. Thank you ever so much. Mr. Smith, Mr. Saris, Mr. Dixit, Mrs. White, thanks for a great presentation on the capital budget. We appreciate it. Thank you. Next on our agenda, item L, is board member committee updates. Let's see if we can rapidly go through these. The audit committee, Mr. Yulefelder, any report? Other than what was passed out in that one. All right, building and contract, anything? No, no report. How about curriculum, Mr. Young? Really briefly, um, we had a lot of wonderful information presented to us, but also um, we would like to say that that meeting was Ms. Adekoya's first meeting, and while we didn't really give her the heads up of what to expect, she did um, do a fine job of jumping right in and making herself um, at home and asking questions and being a valuable contributor. Very good. Very good. Uh, how about digital safety? Mrs. Hen, is there anything to report? And how about policy review? Uh, I would join my colleague in, in recognizing the, the our new student member to jump right in tonight, Ms. Sayakoya. Congratulations, outstanding job. Uh, with regard to the policy review committee, its next uh, meeting, our committee will have its next meeting on September 17th. There are some information items on uh, our materials. Our next board meeting is September 11. We're adjourned. Thank you.